This presentation explores some of the influences and technology that will impact fashion in the crinoline era from 1850 to 1870. First, the influence of technology in general. For fashion particularly, we will get a new machine that will change how clothing is made. The sewing machine and garment manufacture will change. In the 1840s, the sewing machine was invented earlier, but uh, it took a while before it was actually commercially viable, and a big breakthrough happened when a sewing machine that was available to home sewers was made possible. John Fisher invented the first commercially viable sewing machine, and um, Elias Howe and Isaac Singer who you might have heard of, managed to outmaneuver him with legalities, and they stole his patent and created Singer and Howe sewing machines. By the 1850s, several firms started to make sewing machines, allowing these to be distributed widely. The second invention is the home sewing pattern. This is an American invention. Uh, it begins in the 1860s, and uh, Madame Demarest is famous for having thought of the idea. She published patterns in a magazine uh, that were one size fits all and flat paper patterns that each sewer could then adapt to their own need. A big breakthrough came along in 1863 when Ebenezer Butterick developed standard graded sizes for those patterns. Another invention is aniline dyes. These were formed by the early oil industry using coal tar, and they resulted in these searing colors. We often think because we look at photography of the Victorian era that everyone was in black and white and sepia, but actually they wore some amazingly bright colors. Of course, aniline dyes and uh, many of the chemicals that we used in fashion, we weren't quite familiar yet with the hazards of handling them. And so aniline dyes, some dyes, were poisonous to wear and certainly poisonous for the workers. Another invention is incorporating steel into fashion. Once we had a steel industry and factories that could roll and mill steel, fashion took a leap in the 1840s. Skirts became so large that women were wearing five to seven petticoats. Finally, the pannier from the 18th century re-emerged. This time we call it the crinoline. And that is what the entire fashion era is named after. So the first crinolines were made of baleen or whalebone. The idea of creating them in steel, whoever thought of it first, is now lost to us in history. However, we do have a patent for one, so we can trace the 1850s as the beginning of the steel hoop or the crinoline. These could be made in the new factories, and so they were remarkably cheap. So this is the first fashion, high fashion item that can be worn by women of all classes. In this context, we think of industrial technology being applied directly to fashion. And we see some, I see some similarities between a hoop skirt on the left, the crinoline, and some of the new architecture that we'll look at that is made with glass and wrought iron on the right. You can see a steel dome, or a wrought iron dome, and a steel crinoline. The cage crinoline, once invented, allowed skirts to get even larger. And this would become an interesting aspect to uh, conspicuous consumption. So we will see skirts get larger and larger through this era. Steel was also applied to corsetry. Once steel bones were made, we could do things like tight lacing because the bones could stand up to the strain. We have another new invention called the busk, and that is something that opens in the front. You can see at the top center different versions. Those are latches on the steel bones. 
and that allowed corsets to open up the front. So no longer did women have to entirely lace them from the back. There will still be a lacing panel on the back to adjust the fit, but this makes corsets remarkably easier to get in and out of. The Great Exhibition of 1851 is one of those cultural landmarks that historians talk about, and it will have a huge effect on the Victorian imagination and Victorian aesthetics. It took place in the Crystal Palace, which was purpose-built just for this exhibition. It was a celebration of industry, what countries are making from handcrafts to technology. Visitors could watch the entire process of something being made, such as cotton production, from spinning to finished cloth. It was organized by Prince Albert, who is Queen Victoria's husband, and Henry Cole. And it was modeled on some French exhibitions the French had started to feature aspects of their industry, but those were local exhibitions. This is one of the first huge pan exhibitions that attracted tourists from all over. The Crystal Palace itself was an architectural wonder, and it assembled glass panes and wrought iron. It was large enough to house full-size trees that were already growing in Hyde Park where it was located. So you can see at the end of this image, there's a tree that had already been in the park. So that gives you an idea of the scale. The sides of the building housed individual booths assembled by the different nations. One of them included a history of art. A huge impact came from countries such as Turkey, India, and China. Japan and China had a huge effect on Victorian aesthetics, as we will see. At the time of the Great Exhibition in London, Japan was still a closed society. Foreigners were prevented from entering Japan, except for a small Dutch trading post at Nagasaki. And Japanese citizens were not allowed to travel abroad. A small number of Japanese goods were included in the Great Exhibition, but were placed in the Chinese section, since there was no official Japanese booth. With the end of Japan's isolation in 1853, information and artifacts will begin to flow out of Japan toward Europe and America, and we will see the influence that will have. Another important uh, concept that comes to us from the Victorian era is the haute couture. So this is when high fashion haute couture is invented. It is a reaction to mass faction. And uh, Charles and Marie Worth are the two that are credited with founding the couture industry. Um, he founded the House of Worth and he was a draper, what was called a draper, which actually sold fabric goods. He wasn't making patterns, as we call the term draper today. He transformed himself into a dressmaker. So Worth invents the couture, and what is the couture exactly? Now it's a global industry. Worth was, the term couturier was invented exactly for Worth because he was a male dressmaker. And before this time, there had been uh, two very important names in history, Rosa Bertin and Louis Hippolyta Leroy, that some can argue were the first couture designers. However, uh, Worth was the first to, in, to create a very influential business that then swayed other businesses to open and join the couture industry. He was the first to design a collection, not just a dress for a patron. He made a range of dresses, including every kind of occasion in life. He was the first to prepare collections in advance and as an investment and then present them in, to his clientele. And he was the first to sew in a label in the garments with his name on it. So these are considered very important elements of what is couture fashion. He was also the first to place an advertisement for his business. He was the first to radically reshape fashion at will 
just because he w wanted something to change or he thought the zeitgeist was changing. He hated the crinoline particularly and he is credited with the transition to the bustle. This is a huge influence on the larger picture of fashion. He was the first to use live models to show the dresses and he was the first to address a woman's whole wardrobe from maternity needs, lingerie, bridal, mourning, everyday wear, children's wear, etc. So what exactly is couture fashion? How does it come about? And we will look at why it's a little different than mass manufacture. So the first step is ideas. Illustrate the ideas. A designer decides that in the zeitgeist I see this and that and I'm going to reflect that in fashions of the day. So these are actual concept sketches from the House of Worth. The second step is to create those samples for the new styles. So uh, this is a picture a little later because that's the first photo I could find showing these samples. But you get the idea that the different pieces that are in the collection are shown to the patrons. These are high quality garments. Once a patron selected a garment, it would then be made just for them. And Worth is also known for making a component system. Instead of making an entire gown from top to bottom, he made things that could fit together in different variations. So a bodice could fit all the different sleeve types. The skirt could be sewn or worn with the bodice. And so by mixing and matching, every single garment that came out of the House of Worth was unique. The third step is to choose the fabric. You like the sample, but you don't like the color it came in, perhaps. So also, the couturier was very happy to provide the fabric as well. And so this is where the connection of becoming a fabric seller and a couturier first began. And so the customer chose the sample garment, then chose the fabric, and that also contributed to a unique design for every customer. And then the last step in the couture is the garment is made to your measurements and to fit you. And so there were a series of in-person fittings. This is very exclusive and no other customer will end up with exactly the same style. This required the most skilled sewing, the finest fabrics, and it was very labor intensive to achieve. Clearly only the most wealthy people could afford this process. This exclusivity was touted in the fashion press. Why shop with the madding crowd, the trampling in the stores, and common taste when you, as a person of distinction, could have a distinctive fashion and fashion experience. Men have their own version of the couture, except we don't call it that until uh, much later in the 70s and 60s. So the tradition of tailoring for men is the uh, exclusive experience for them. We call this bespoke tailoring. Tailoring that is made, custom made, directly for a particular customer. We call that a bespoke suit. The term comes from Earlier in practice, when in the 18th century a gentleman would stop by a tailor's uh, emporium and choose the fabric they want and have that set aside, that fabric then could not be sold to another customer, so it was already considered to be spoken for or bespoke. In 1846, the modern Savile Row is founded by a tailoring company called Henry Poole. And Savile Row is an actual street in London, and it has the same connotations. If something is a Savile Row suit, that sets it apart in the world of our understanding, just like haute couture does for women. So what is custom tailoring? Where does a suit come from? There are all kinds of tailors. Just because one is a tailor doesn't mean we're, they're all master tailors capable of doing bespoke suiting. So custom tailoring, a master tailor actually originates the pattern for that suit and for that customer. 
most tailoring that is still considered somewhat bespoke or custom is actually made to measure. The difference with made to measure is the tailor uses a base pattern. It's hanging on the wall, it already exists, and they just, I've been to Savile Row, I see them just lift it off the wall, lay it on the fabric, and create a suit. They alter that pattern a little here, a little there, to the customer's measurements. Custom tailoring takes about 12 weeks from the first order, and that suit would cost anywhere between six to eight, maybe $10,000 at the highest. Made to measure is significantly less expensive, but still expensive. It's about eight weeks to get the order from a Savile Row institution, and uh, cost would about $2,000 to $4,000. Some tailors were so exclusive, you were not allowed to be their customer. You had to be a member of high society or recommended by someone or introduced by someone of high society. Henry Poole was one of these um, exclusive tailors. Anderson and Shepherd is Prince Charles Taylor, and Greaves and Hawks are famous for having done Winston Churchill, Charlie Chaplin, Michael Jackson and David Beckham. Some tailors, particularly during the Victorian era, did not allow show folk or, when we get to film, Hollywood stars to be their customers, but others clearly did. What are the hallmarks of fine tailoring? It takes several fittings for a custom made suit and here you can see white lines on the outside of that suit that's all white thread stitching done in very large stitches so it can be taken out easily without harming or marking the wool that's called basting the suit will be put together basted together to fit the customer and then taken apart to finish it another hallmark is the interior the canvas, which is a layer you can see here on the collar and the chest, it looks gray, light gray or white. There's a canvas sewn into the suit and that's what keeps the shape in a tailored garment. In a, in a tailored, custom-made suit, this hand canvas is sewn in entirely with stitches by hand. These are the different kinds of canvases. If you see a suit, and you're curious uh, about the quality of it. I've done this in thrift stores, certainly. If you can find a way to kind of unpick the lining and look inside, on the left, we have what is done modernly today. And this is what makes a suit possible to get for about $200 today. That's incredibly cheap. The canvas is actually fused in with heat and glue. This is a very cheap quality suit. And it'll be fine for a while, but it is not going to hold up over the long run. In the center, we have a compromise, the half canvas. So that canvas will be sewn in as far as the chest, and certainly it will be uh, sewn to shape the collar. On the right, we have the full canvas with the entire suit hand-stitched on the inside to fuse all those layers together and create the shaping. That is the hallmark of a fully custom suit. Other details for Savile Row that we will now find copied on manufactured garments, certainly, is the label is hidden inside the pocket very discreetly. There's no label on the back or on the outside of the pocket so everyone can see where you shopped. There's no care labels inside or fiber content labels because you did not buy this retail and that's where the laws actually apply. Uh, it is a perfectly flat suit. It is very fine and thin. There are slightly rounded corners instead of uh, perfectly sharp corners, which you can see, you can somewhat see at the bottom of the buttons here. There's hand picked stitching along the collar and lapel. You can see an example of that on the right. The Germans have invented a machine that can do this, by the way, perfectly imitate this hand stitching. And another uh, thing is the buttons on the cuff of the suit actually unbutton. 
the lining is sewn in by hand in a custom-made suit and underneath the collar and back you will see wool sewn it's, it's an, a, in a complementary color and um, the pattern matching in the suit is cut perfectly on the right you can see the pocket flap matches the plaid underneath it You'll also see a handmade buttonhole on the lapel and very high quality horn or bone buttons. Um, this is kind of a secret sign. The quality of the button is very easy to pick out if you're in the know. Another aspect that will inform Victorian fashion is conspicuous consumption, which we have been talking about in the Romantic era, and it will hit its heyday from the 1850s to about World War I. So from here on out, we will be looking at examples of how we can display our wealth to set us apart from the masses who can now buy fashions. The lure of military uniforms is going to influence women's wear, and one of the first examples of that will be the Zouave jacket, which I will tell you more about in another presentation. This is named after the Algerian or French uh, infantry serving in Africa that was considered very exotic, and they were brave and much written about and admired, so there were units in the U.S. Army and the Civil War that named themselves after these Algerians, the Zouaves. They then adapted their uniform, and so women are going to adapt the Civil War U.S. Army jacket into their wardrobe. We'll also see a heavy military influence in this era with a trim called passementary or passementaire. And this is heavy braiding buttons and tassels and ball fringe inspired by the height of uniform military design. On the right, you see a photo of a very impressive soldier with his mutton chops and all of the braids across his uniform. Women will adopt that kind of design into their everyday wardrobes. Another example of a military uniform is the uh, Garibaldi shirt, which was a red shirt worn by Italian freedom fighters while Italy was struggling to become one country. It wasn't a country until now. The Garibaldi shirt, the red blouse, will then be adopted into women's fashion. It'll be made of red wool or flannel. And um, this is a very interesting step in women's wear, which we will talk about a little bit later and continuously, is the blouse enters the women's wardrobe. And it's very difficult now for us in black and white photography to tell if someone is wearing a Garibaldi blouse, but the distinctive shape and sleeves can be a clue. And so I think this woman in the photograph on the right is wearing a Garibaldi blouse. Red in black and white photography often looks near black and the shape and the sleeves are very distinctive. This happens to be Mary Jane Patterson, the first black woman to graduate from college um, in, from Oberlin in 1862. She became a very successful teacher and principal for America's first high school for black students. And she also took a picture of herself in a Garibaldi blouse. So women adopt the man's white shirt. Stealing this status symbol is a, a landmark for women. The blouse and skirt enters the woman's wardrobe for the first time in perhaps costume history. And for women, it can often be a much more freeing thing. While it could be a status symbol and um, of confining garment for men during this period, it is much more freeing for women to be able to mix and match elements of a blouse. Not to, not to uh, skip over the fact they just blatantly stole a masculine item from the male wardrobe. We are going to continue to see nostalgia and revivals. They will come along at a much faster rate now that we have couture designers. 
And so couture designers, instead of doing a full-on revival, many times will incorporate elements of history. They will study portraits from the past for details and incorporate elements as we go. Another very important thing to stop and consider in this period is uh, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, an activist in Germany, who theorized that there was a third gender, that the binary definitions society had been using do not really take into consideration the psyche. So fashion deals with your appearance and the appearance of the gender, but it does not take into consideration, it did not at this time, take into consideration that you might feel quite differently on the inside than what fashion provides for you on the outside. So this is a landmark moment. This is um, in, he began his publishing in about 1864 and it went on to about 1870. And let's bear in mind that this is almost uh, well over 20 years before Freud begins practicing and begins what we would call psychoanalysis. So in the zeitgeist, we have activists starting to question not only the binary gender definition, but what is fashion's role in that question? And we will see, as we go through this era, other people starting to question this. So this is a very important concept for us here. I will uh, finish this with our dog in history because um, chinoiserie and Japanism is about to become a huge influence. I couldn't resist noting that the Pekingese dog was brought to Britain during this era, during the Britain uh, and China Opium Wars. So we now have a specific dog that will fit the new zeitgeist. And I also can't help but notice we have a great moment in chocolate history. The Cadbury brothers in England begin marketing something called eating chocolates, small chocolates that you could eat one at a time. Americans see this at the great exhibition in London. And by 1861, Girardelli has created in San Francisco cocoa powder that you can mix into recipes and into drinks.